Okay, we've made it out of the dark days of the Puritans and are moving into the American Enlightenment. As with any sort of cultural history, dates are difficult. Ask five historians when the American Enlightenment began and you'll likely get five different answers. One way to measure it, though, is to ask when the ideas of the European Enlightenment began to be taught in colonial schools. As you'll find until the 20th century, American art and literature were always about a generation behind those of Europe, and while heavily influenced by their European predecessors, were never identical to them. In 1714, a tutor at the recently founded Yale College received a large collection of significant European Enlightenment books, works by important authors such as John Locke, Isaac Newton, and John Milton. Two years later, he began teaching a wholly new curriculum at Yale based on those works. Whether or not you consider this pedagogical change as the spark that ignited the American Enlightenment, however you look at it, you can see that during these early years of the 18th century, the society within the ever-expanding British colonies began to reject its puritanical underpinnings and to embrace the ideals of reason. We can call this period that roughly fits into the 18th century the American Enlightenment, or the Age of Reason, or the Revolutionary Era. All these labels suggest the same thing, that this was a time of great intellectual pursuit, scientific advancement, and social upheaval. When Samuel Johnson opened that shipment of books, he, and subsequently everyone in the British colonies, was exposed to the radical thinking that had begun, been going on throughout Europe for more than a generation. Perhaps it's better to use Thomas Paine's term, the age of reason, to discuss this period because that label captures what drove the way people thought during this time. As were the Puritans, the Enlightenment thinkers were driven by a need to understand the world in which they live. Puritan thinking, as does any orthodoxy, bases all truth on the word of God. For the Puritans and their immediate descendants, the Bible held all the knowledge necessary to function in this world. To understand our existence, one need only look at the Bible for answers. Many, though, began questioning this. And the Enlightenment really comes about simply as a result of some great minds turning away from tradition and turning towards. Rene Descartes made the simple but subversive statement, cardito ergo sum, which rests at the core of the Enlightenment thinking. The Puritans relied upon faith to understand the world. Descartes and his followers relied upon reason. That, in a nutshell, is the paradigm shift that takes place from the European Puritan settlements of the late 17th century to the British colonies of the early 18th century. To understand why this is so significant, we need to consider some of the more specific ideas that helped shape the Enlightenment in Europe and eventually in America. In 1651, Thomas Hobbes published his book Leviathan, in which he set forth his theory of the social contract, arguing that in a natural state, mankind is a brute living in anarchy. To avoid constant strife and violence, Hobbes believed, mankind chooses to come together to form communities. Thus, we surrender some of our natural freedoms in exchange for the safety and stability provided by society. In Leviathan, Hobbes also formulated his argument for natural law which best, perhaps, most radically opposed the beliefs of the Puritans, or really any religion. Hobbes's natural law claimed that morality came from man's ability to reason instead of any religious tradition. In 1687, Isaac Newton, a British mathematician, published his Laws of Motion and of Universal Gravitation, concepts that have been at the foundation of physical science ever since. Newton's ideas helped establish our scientific understanding of the universe. In 1689, British philosopher John Locke published his essay concerning human understanding, in which he espoused, among other things, his theory of the tabula rasa, or blank slate. Here, Locke essentially says that a human being is born without any knowledge or methods of interpreting information. Locke said that we know and what we know and how we learn develop as a result of our experiences in the real world. Thus, Locke suggested that each individual is responsible for the development of his or her own identity. These are just three examples of the kind of thinking developed during the European Enlightenment and imported to the British colonies at the beginning of the 18th. Now ask yourself, what is it that these have in common? What's the common thread that binds them together?
if you said they all help us human beings to understand the nature of our existence, you've got it. They attempt to explain logically, scientifically, the world in which we live. Again, that's the key to understanding Enlightenment thinking. The Puritans and their ilk understood humanity, the world, the universe, biblically. That's all they needed. At some point, though, people started saying that's not enough. There's more to it than that. And from that challenge grows the age of reason. So here's an example of how this way of thinking changed even the most fundamental belief. During the Enlightenment, we see a rise in the religious belief system called deism. Deism was adopted by many Christians disillusioned by organized religion. Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? Deists use reason to establish their religious beliefs instead of the Bible or tradition. Logically, the deists said, the universe is too complex to have come into existence by random accident. Therefore, it must have been made by a creator deity. However, beyond the complexity of the universe, the deists saw no other empirical evidence to support the version of God espoused by the Bible. Deists saw God as what they called a great watchmaker, someone who created this complex system, wound it up to get things started, and then handed it over to mankind. We hear many people these days claim that the United States, founded in the midst of the Enlightenment, was founded as a Christian country. However, many of our founding fathers were in fact deists, who did not accept the divinity of Jesus. How could they, without any empirical evidence to prove it? Thomas Paine, Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, all were deists. Jefferson was He went so far as to produce a version of the Gospels in which he had excuse me, in which he had cut out any suggestion of the miraculous, thus presenting Jesus as a great moral philosopher, but not the Son of God. So how does all this fit in with American literature? The New World was still pretty far behind the Old World, especially in terms of literary production. Printing continued to become less expensive and more commonplace, but there's not much literature being published. What was being published often was argumentative. People continued to use the printing press as a means of disseminating their ways of thinking through political tracts, pamphlets, and personal narratives. In Europe, the novel was just coming into existence around 1720 with the publication of Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe and Maul Flanders. By the second half of the 18th century, we begin to see greater production of literary texts in America, but it's not until after the revolution that the establishment of the United States that Americans really turn their attentions toward a true literary. Once again, be thinking about these things, this new way of thinking about the world, as you work through Equiano's narrative, but also be thinking about how we have moved from Mary Rowlandson's narrative to Equiano's. Rowlandson is credited with the invention of the genre of the captivity narrative, and while Equiano didn't write the first slave narrative, he did write the first one to become an international bestseller. They have plenty in common, even though they are children of two diametrically opposed societies. Okay, thanks again for watching. I hope these help. Once again, please take a few minutes to complete the survey. I'll see you in class.